Hey, church family, thanks for joining me today for our Bible study and prayer time. I hope you're having a good week. Just a couple quick reminders as we get started tonight. We want to take time to pray, and I want to encourage you to be doing that. Pray with us tonight, but please be praying every single day. If you didn't get the prayer list, please uh, download it, reach out to us, and we'll email it to you. And let's continue to pray for those on our prayer list, those who are in need, those who are struggling, those who are, have health issues. Be praying for Alma and her family tonight. Continue to pray for the Perlmans as well and their family. And uh, just continue to, to remember one another in prayer. Also, please pray for our church. These are uh, great times to do ministry. And what I mean by that is um, the needs are still great and help help us by praying for us that we'll just stay committed and resolute and focused on what's most important and that is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people uh, who need desperately to know so be praying for us uh, for the leadership here if you would and you're a vital part of that and, and I want to encourage you to continue to pray if we don't pray we waste our time and then let's continue to pray for our country, our nation. First Timothy 2 reminds us that we're to pray for, for all of our leaders and quite frankly for all men uh, because this is uh, good and this is acceptable uh, in the sight of the Lord. And so let's continue to pray. Let's pray that uh, our uh, country will be a country that pursues truth and righteousness. Be praying for those who are leading. Pray for those who will be leading. Uh, just pray that they would seek the things that God so greatly desires. It's not about God becoming a part of what we're doing. It's about us as people and us as a nation uh, joining what, what God says to be true. So pray, pray for all the events and all that's still taking place and some of the confirmations and just pray that truth and, and righteousness will be declared and, and will be revealed. And uh, I know that God uh, will hear and answer prayer and that's our prayer uh, tonight. Also, a couple quick announcements. Remember this Sunday, we're going to continue to honor some of our first responders, our firemen and our military. So join us for that in our services this week. Also, it's our Thanksgiving food pantry drive, an opportunity for you to be a help and a blessing to people in their time of need. And so we need three items uh, from you. If you'd like to donate, we need stuffing, we need rice, and we need cranberry sauce, those three things. So if you'd like to help and be a part of that, you can bring them in on Sunday and, and, and drop those uh, supplies, those donations into uh, the barrels that will be in the lobby. Uh, if, if it's easier for you just to give online uh, for the Thanksgiving food pantry drive, you can do that as well. And we hope that the Saturday before Thanksgiving, we can be a blessing to those in our community uh, by really presenting them a Thanksgiving basket. That'll be an encouragement to them. So I want to encourage you to be a part of that. And then men, remember our barbecue this Friday night, 630. We're praying the weather will be great as it has been. And uh, we're looking forward to our time together. Uh, 630 to about 830. Join us if you can. We'll be outside and, and uh, having a great time, a fellowship uh, together, and a challenge from the Word of God. So I hope you'll be praying, be praying about all these things. Continue to pray as we move forward and as we seek to uphold God's truth. Really tonight, our Bible study, it, it falls right in line with that. Uh, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. And uh, we find that, uh, as in Jonah's day, we're living in a world that needs God. And thanks be to God that he has chosen to use you and me to be the messengers of the good news. And as we've been studying this biography of Jonah and his life, we've seen how God had a purpose and a plan. We've seen how we had the ability to say no to that plan, but look at the consequences and and. and and uh, just the shame that comes with saying no, but we're also reminded um, of, of the great mercy of God. Notice in chapter 3, the Bible says, So the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Uh, again, God is a God of second chances. He's also the God of the 99th chance. And, and how grateful we need to be. Uh, Jonah repents, he, he confesses, and that great fish is told to vomit him up. And now Jonah finds himself back in the land, if you will, of the living. And God says, okay, Jonah, I have a job for you to do. 
And I can only imagine what he's thinking. It's probably what many of us are thinking, as, as we have often told God, no, uh, no thank you. And we've resisted and we've fought and we've struggled and gotten the consequences and finally gotten things right, only to think to ourselves, no, God, some time has passed and hopefully you still don't want me to do that. But often God does still want us to do what he originally had asked us to do. And the reason being is because he knew that was best and we needed to do that and it had a bigger purpose. So thus is the case with Jonah. And he says to Jonah, I need you to go back, verse 2, to Nineveh, that great city. Same request. Uh, and let me just pause for a moment and let's just consider and think about this tonight uh, before we move on. But we need to acknowledge and to remember how merciful God is. And I hope that you'll take a moment to just thank God for his mercy in your life. Uh, his mercy not giving us what we deserve. Uh, every day, God is merciful to us. He's merciful to us. It's active, meaning that we can see it every single day. The sun shines on us. The rain falls on us. The paycheck comes in. Uh, we have food on our table. I mean, God is merciful to us every single day. And we need to be reminded that his mercy is very patient. Uh, here you're going to see that um, God is very merciful toward the Ninevites. But that wasn't unlike his actions toward Jonah. He was merciful to Jonah time and time again. And you and I need to, to, to be thankful for that. And every day we're to call, Hebrews 4 tells us, and ask God for his mercy in our life. And what a, a, a good example for us as Christians. We ought to see to be merciful as our Father is merciful to us. Blessed are the merciful, Jesus said, for they shall obtain mercy. So instead of getting angry and critical and judgmental and cutting people off, It'd be good for us to stop. It'd be good for us to reflect and be good for us to remember God's been merciful to me and I should seek to do the same. Not that there aren't consequences, not that things don't change, but we should be extenders of mercy in our life so that we might be like our Heavenly Father. Well, that's a task for Jonah and will he do it? Will he be obedient? Will he show mercy? Well, notice we're told that God says, arise and go back. And we know this is a big hub. The Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Over 100,000 people living there, which was a large city for the time. But notice verse 2, his instructions differed from the first time. Hey, first time he said in chapter 1, cry against the city, their wickedness has come before me. But this time he says, and I want you to preach the preaching that I bid you. I want you to go there and I want you to preach and I want you to preach what I tell you to preach. Now, perhaps he knew Jonah might reluctantly go and not really deliver the message that he needed to deliver. Perhaps he knew Jonah would go and boy, Jonah would have a message, but it's not what God wanted said. So very clearly, God says, you're going to not teach, not counsel, but you are going to preach boldness clarity, sim simplistically. I want you to deliver this message and preach what I tell you to preach. And what was that message? You see in verse 4, the message was 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. <sighs> That's a harsh message. I want you to go to Nineveh, this huge town. It was a, a town about 60 miles wide in diameter. It was, it was measured in, in walking distance. It would take a person about three days to go from side to side. And I want you to preach clearly this message that you've got 40 days, Nineveh, and if you don't turn to God, he's going to overthrow you. I mean, imagine walking into your enemy's home and, and saying that, delivering those words, but that's the message what will what will Jonah do? And, you know, I find that as I think about this and have been, we're living in a wicked world. Uh, we're living in a world that uh, needs Jesus Christ. That hasn't changed. Uh, but maybe for some of us in our lifetime, we've just seen things a little more clearly. We, we, we see how sin is able to be... Um, um, if I could say, 
broadcast and um, advertised and propagated in ways that never has been with social media and just with the technology of this world. And uh, it just seems like uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, sin is running rampant. And the answer for man's sin problem is Jesus Christ. And we have been tasked to share that that mercy and to share God's love and to deliver that message. And I find it interesting that all of us are in the same uh, position uh, which Jonah found himself. What will we do? And God very clearly, as with Jonah, has mandated that we go and preach the gospel. Now, why would he care so much about Nineveh? I mean, why God? Again, because of God's mercy. And by the way, how hypocritical of Jonah. He, he uh, no doubt struggled. God, Nineveh has been so wicked and so horrendous in their actions toward Israel. And why, God, why? And we know this was something he continued to struggle with. And yet the, the answer, the mercy of God, didn't seem to resonate with Jonah. But it should have because God's been merciful to me. Jonah should have thought, why would he want to be merciful to the Ninevites? And the same thing is so true of us. We don't seem at times to care about other people or they look different from us or they're, they've got different upbringings and backgrounds or ideologies. Forget it now, especially politically. They, they have different politics, and so I'm not even going to talk to them about that. And, and what is the most important priority uh, is Jesus Christ and him to be exalted. And, and, and we somehow have a disconnect between his mercy in my life and God's mercy and love for the whole world. God saw Nineveh as a multitude of people who were lost. Remember when Jesus said in Matthew 9 with his disciples and he looked across the crowds and he saw them as sheep having no shepherd? Uh, they were lost. It's true. They were a whole big group of people who were just involved in wickedness and they needed to turn to God. You know, we use the words like revival at times and we often think about revival uh, as a... a, a a goal for Christians, believers who have gone astray from God and now to come back to God. And that's true, but really revival is something that needs to take place in, in, in the heart and the life of a people who have thought to themselves that they could live life uh, apart from God. And obviously the Ninevites thought that. They didn't know God and perhaps have a need in their minds for God. And so God wanted them to repent and turn to him. And because of his great mercy, he tasked Jonah to deliver the message and to make sure it's the right message. He's very clear. You need to preach it. And might I remind us today, whoever you are, uh, it doesn't matter. You are tasked as a Christian to be a preacher of the gospel. Now, you may say, wait a minute, I'm not a preacher. I'm not an evangelist. Perhaps you don't get up behind a pulpit, maybe like I do and preach, but you're a minister. By our lives, we preach a message. By our words, we're to be very specific, very clear, and in some ways very simplistic, that it's to be uh, Christ and, and Him crucified, and we're to do it with boldness. We are told to deliver His message His way. And I, I, I believe that this needs to be said. So many of us sometimes as Christians and churches and ministries have gotten uh, duped into this idea that I can deliver the gospel, but I can do it in a different way. I'm going to do it in a watered down way or in a, in a more non-confrontational way, or I'm going to uh, try to present some truths of the gospel, but mixed in with some of my thoughts and ideas. And, and I think maybe our efforts in some ways and our intentions maybe were right. And we, we just at times tend to, to shrill about the word preaching because it just sounds almost in some ways too forceful. But yet God specifically uses that word. Paul would write in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. I'm going to read those verses. Paul would write, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but he sent me to preach the gospel. He wanted me to preach, not with man's wisdom. He didn't want me to come up with my own thoughts or, or try to deliver it in my own ways. 
because the cross of Christ would be made of none effect. See, the, the preaching he would go on to say of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us who believe it's the power of God. Most people think preaching is uh, outdated and antiquated and uh, foolish. And for unbelievers, uh, most people are drawn to the preaching, but it's not until they hear the, the forthrightness and the truth of the words of God that God takes his word, as Hebrews 4 tells us, and he penetrates the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And God begins to do a great work in people's lives. And oftentimes we we uh, diminish the effectiveness of the Word of God because we don't release it. We hold it back, and we can't do that. God tells us to preach the Word, be bold. Yes, preach the Word in love, of course, and with wisdom, but don't diminish it. Don't negate it. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't, as we would often say, uh, dilute it or water it down. Let it go. Because Jesus said the truth makes people free. The words of God, not my words, the words of God are eternal. The words of God uh, are powerful. They are those things that convict people in their soul. The words of God are life-changing. And you and I will be amazed as we speak to people, our coworkers, our neighbors, our friends, uh, those strangers. Uh, and again, maybe don't look like us. Maybe in, a, in another life we have nothing in common with them. But God loves them and God wants to show mercy to them as he's shown to me. And I'm his representative, so I'm going to preach the word. And if I'll let the words of God go, you and I will be amazed how God takes his word and grips people's hearts. And, and how God begins to enact change in people's lives. People come to repentance. Uh, hopefully you can share that testimony in your own life, that it was the words of God that so moved you and convicted you and brought change into your life. But we have to preach it. Don't, don't fall away from the preaching of the word. Don't be ashamed of the words of God. Uh, your words, your opinion, your associations, uh, you, in comparison to the effectiveness of the Word of God. So Jonah, preach and preach what I tell you to preach. What an orthodox message, but he begins to walk in and says, Nineveh, 40 days, if you don't repent, you're overthrown. And I want you to see the result. The result was this, the Bible says, verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God. How could you ever have anticipated that? I mean, just like that. See, here's the other thing about God. He knows. He knows people's hearts. He knew that they were ready. I mean, why did he keep pressing Jonah? Because, yes, there are so many lost. There was so much wickedness. There were people for whom he loved, but he also knew their hearts were ready. And when God tugs and when God brings people into our life, we can't dismiss that opportunity. We can't shrug it off. We can't think it's no big deal. We can't let our personal agendas and biases and, and, uh, uh, and filters at times keep us from, from really fulfilling God's greatest desire in our lives, and that's to preach the gospel. They were ready. They believed God. I mean, their heart changed. But then true repentance always, always reveals itself in actions. Notice it says that that they put on sackcloth. It's really, they put on mourning clothes, clothes that people would put on when they went to funeral. They were so convicted and they were so grieved by what they were doing. You're right, we've ignored the Almighty God. And they all changed their clothes. They all depressed themselves, if you were, from the greatest to the least. I mean, this just wasn't in poverty areas. This wasn't just among the working class. This was from the socialites, the government officials, verse 6. Even the king got up from his throne, took his robe off, and covered himself with sackcloth and with ashes. The king. Can you imagine if that were to happen all throughout our country today? 
the Hollywood elites, the social media gurus, the tech people, all the Wall Street financiers, all the middle class, blue collar, hard worker people, all the artisans, uh, all those that are uh, involved in just uh, industries today, down to the school teachers, uh, down to the plumbers and the electricians, down to to uh, just those who are impoverished, those homeless, those who are out of work right now. I mean, can you imagine all the way across the board that a national day of mourning and prayer, like just conviction that everybody stopped everything and just put on their funeral clothes and cried out to God? And notice he said the king gave an order. Nobody should eat. Nobody should drink. We are going to fast. As a matter of fact, if you have sackcloth, mourning clothes that you can throw on your beast, do so. And don't let them eat today. I mean, not really knowing what more to do. They just did everything they could to show God that they were broken and repentant. Wow. I'm convinced that if I'll get out and share the gospel of Christ, God will take his word and will move in people's hearts and lives. And when I see that, when I experience that, it just so motivates me to want to do it again and want to share it again. For some of us, I think we haven't done that in a while. We, we haven't really opened our mouth. We, we've been involved in other perhaps events or, or uh, activities, and we really haven't invested our time in sharing the the powerful truths of the word of God with people. But if we'll do that, it'll just refuel and ignite us to want to do more and more and more because you see the word of God alive and you see how God honors this word. And we're told that they cry out. We don't know, but this is all we can offer. Maybe God will be merciful to us. Verse 10, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. So God repented. It means God changed his mind on overthrowing them, and he did it not. What does that mean? God forgave them. God showed mercy. How could he do that? Because he did it for Jonah. How could he do that? Because he's done it for you, and he's done it for me. God is a God of mercy, a God of love. God is desirous that all men come to him and he's chosen to use you and he's chosen to use me recipients of that love and mercy he's chosen to use us to deliver that message to a world who doesn't know what's standing in your way what hinders you and hinders me from opening my mouth and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ yes in wisdom yes in love what hinders me may God help us to to go forth and release his word, not be ashamed of it, not hide it, not dilute it, but preach it so that God can do his work according to his will, according to his way, so that many might come to repentance. So I challenge you, join me, church, everywhere you go, look for opportunities, preach the gospel, and let's let God use us each and every day to point people to him. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, thank you for your word and the power of it. Help us not to be ashamed of it. It's the power of God. Forgive us where we try to change it and water it down and kind of smooth talk and add our two thoughts to it. And we just need to move out of the way and preach the truth. He that has the son has life. He that hath not the son of God is not life. And Lord, help us to know you will take your words And you will work in people's hearts and lives. I pray that, Lord, we'll take this next chance, much like Jonah, and that we'll go forth. And when you work in our heart and lead us, that we'll open our mouth and we'll speak it and we'll preach it and we'll share it. Lord, let us live it so that people might be saved. Thank you for your mercy in our life. Thank you for your love. Help us to never forget it. Bless us as we go to prayer tonight and uphold one another in prayer. Lord, we're grateful it's all in your hands. And so, God, thank you for all you've done. Thank you for what you're going to do. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
and God bless you. Join us now as we pray. We'll see you on Sunday, God willing.